You're listening to ReachMD XM160, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Hot Topics in Allergy, presented by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Your host is Dr. Caton Sheth, Medical Director of the Lafayette Allergy and Asthma Clinic in Lafayette, Indiana. What do physicians need to be aware of when treating sudden onset of allergy to insects outside of a clinical setting? Joining us to discuss managing insect allergy in non-traditional sites, from the military to first response, is Dr. Renata Engler, Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences and Founder and Director of the Vaccine Healthcare Centers Network. Welcome, Dr. Engler. Thank you. Well, is insect allergy exposure based on occupation or leisure activities? Yes. The risk for potentially being stung or bitten by an insect potentially increases the more you are in environments where insects are, and that frequently is in the out-of-doors, and particularly for military personnel crawling on the ground, you know, working in dense foliage areas where you can't see, the risk of potentially being exposed and not being able to prevent it is much higher. And in fact, all emergency responders, whether you're talking about firemen or forest rangers, have unique occupational exposure risks that are very different from someone who is generally working in a city environment or in a cultivated suburban area. And particularly for folks who are in remote areas far removed from emergency rooms or hospitals, the risk of a severe allergic hypersensitivity reaction that can be life-threatening is really greater because access to care and, most important, access to life-saving adrenaline or epinephrine may be extremely limited. Well, what are some of the stinging insects or things that people need to be concerned about here in the U.S. as well as around the world for some of the military personnel? Well, certainly bee sting allergy, whether that's honeybee, wasp, yellow jacket, yellow hornets, white-faced hornets, and the many different varieties of bees that exist around the world, and particularly honeybee because that is a source of income and of food, is a particularly high-risk exposure in any parts of the world. Early on at the start of the Iraq invasion, folks thought that there were no bees in the desert, but in actual fact, it is cultivated there and there's a risk of exposure there as well. In other parts of the world, the variation environmentally and genetic variations alter the aggressiveness of some bees. And I think everyone has heard about the killer bees that came up from South America And as those intermingle also with the more docile bees, they become aggressive so that, you know, if anyone is within a certain perimeter of their hive, they actively attack and have killed both animals and people as a result of those attacks. And secondarily, rescue workers were at great risk because they didn't have the kind of protective gear that was needed. And the protective gear is actually quite expensive. So there are, again, for the first responders, depending on where they are, a variety of unique issues. In the United States, particularly fire ant in the southwest and ever moving further north, particularly with climate changes, present a particular problem, not just for first responders and the military and their training camps, but pretty much for anybody because, again, they're widely present And they tend to be aggressive, so there are descriptions of them attacking actually patients in nursing homes, people walking on sidewalks. But if you're working in the context of, again, first responder emergency situations or in the military training sites, clearly your exposure risk goes up. And there have been actually published studies showing that it's almost impossible to avoid. And then the insect world certainly presents in terms of biting and stinging insect a vast array of exposures in any environment in the world, I guess, except the Arctic zones. And so it's just part of the environment that everyone has the potential to be exposed to. And based on diverse immune response and probably genetic risk factors, there's always the opportunity that someone can be sensitized and then can have a severe life-threatening allergic reaction. 
And the treatment for that, again, is one of the areas that are in great need of improvement throughout the healthcare system, whether that's in emergency rooms or primary care settings or in the specialist office. Well, comment a little bit more about that. What are the best ways to respond to and treat anaphylaxis? Well, the first challenge, and I just wanted to highlight that the concerns about recognizing and diagnosing anaphylaxis and then treatment resulted in just in 2006 in an NIH-sponsored symposium to update guidelines for diagnostic criteria because so often it can be missed, particularly if the early symptoms appear mild, and yet those mild symptoms can rapidly evolve to become more severe or can become severe in a delayed fashion several hours from the acute onset. And then, so the first challenge is diagnosis. And, you know, if people have hives and angioedema, that helps in general signal that there's a risk. But even in that area, people make the assumption, oh, it's probably just going to be hives, not realizing that you have to be very careful to still consider the risk of hypotension and life-threatening cardiovascular and respiratory compromise. And some of us like to think of anaphylaxis a little bit like appendicitis, that you have to over-diagnose because if you only diagnose and treat purely classic anaphylaxis, then you're going to miss some, and those are the ones that also have the potential of evolving to what's known as rapidly progressive anaphylaxis, which can kill over a very short period of time, including minutes. And the single most important intervention to save lives is early diagnosis and early administration of adrenaline and administration of adrenaline in the proper way so that it can be effective. And that's an area that the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and the larger allergy immunology community is very concerned about because so often folks use antihistamines or steroids which will help some of the symptoms of life-threatening anaphylaxis, but will not actually effectively treat the cardiovascular and potential respiratory compromise with severe upper respiratory obstruction due to the angioedema. And in that context, then when I said, how do you give the epinephrine, many folks still in settings give the old method of subcutaneous administration And the data from Estelle Simon and many others clearly shows that if you give subcutaneous epinephrine, it takes up to 30 minutes or longer before the adrenaline blood levels reach effective levels. And by then, if you have rapidly progressive anaphylaxis, you can have died. And so it must be intramuscular administration And the favored site is in the anterolateral thigh, just like in children for all ages. There it seems to be absorbed the best. And we still have a lot of work to do in terms of needle length issues, particularly now in a culture with increasing obesity. And so the fat layer that it intervenes to before the medicine gets to the muscle potentially may become larger than the length of the needle. And as you know, we only have one epi junior for children and one epi auto injector. I own no stock and have no financial interest, but some kind of auto injectable epinephrine only comes in one size. And if you look at the diversity of the population, that one size fits all doesn't make sense. And increasingly there are concerns that there need to be changes in that. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Hot Topics in Allergy on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Katen Sheth, and joining me to discuss managing insect allergy in non-traditional sites from the military to first response is Dr. Renata Engler, Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences and Founder and Director of the Vaccine Healthcare Centers Network. Well, let's come back to this epi and or administration of epinephrine. Certainly, how do you guys go about it in the military, having people carry it or storing it, especially if they're in very warm climates? What are some of your concerns and how do you deal with that? Well, clearly a desert environment where temperatures get to 140, 150 degrees, those are temperatures where adrenaline 
does degrade more rapidly. Now, you don't have to go to the Middle East or the desert to have a problem in that an awful lot of folks stick that auto-injectable epinephrine in the glove compartment of their car. And in the summer, anywhere, it can rapidly reach temperatures over 120 degrees. So it is a challenge for military and first responders, but it's really a challenge for everyone who has this issue of increased risk for anaphylaxis from insect stings or bites or fruit allergy or anything else for that matter, that it doesn't do you much good if you've got it in a drawer or it's not on your person. So we really share in those concerns. We also share with the concern that about 30% of people with a severe anaphylaxis risk need to carry two auto-injectable epinephrine doses, and there are now a variety of carrying devices that have been developed for people to try. It is a problem, and compliance with proper carrying and storing of epinephrine continues to be you know, one of education, education, and resurfacing it with every visit. In high heat scenarios, usually people renew the prescription annually, but probably in these high temperature areas, we need to refresh the prescription more frequently to compensate for the loss. But this is one of the challenges for any profession where you are in a high risk environment and don't have close immediate access to traditional medical resources is for the individual physician and in the military, for us working with our service members, what is too much risk? Is the risk manageable? Or is it something that then prevents them from deploying and potentially restricts their military career? And in terms of military medicine and allergy, this is one of the toughest areas because we have a volunteer force and people want to serve people, whether they're firemen or policemen or soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines. They largely love what they do and have a deep commitment and passion to doing it, plus a deep loyalty to those they serve with. So when they develop a problem, it can be truly heartrending. And that's why, you know, for us, the need for simpler tools like the sublingual tablets would be a huge value add. So let's specifically talk about some of our service personnel who, let's say they become allergic to a stinging insect. Are they allowed to deploy if that's what they're supposed to be doing? Or do you keep them from doing that because of a stinging insect allergy? Well, as we know in medicine, allergy has gradations of severity. And so each case has to be evaluated in regards to the severity of their reaction what their actual profession is. You know, if you're a pharmacist in a stable facility, vice in the infantry or some kind of other more intense remote operational activity, we try obviously to reduce risk through if the immunotherapy is available as it is for fire ants or venom with bee sting. And those therapies can, under a temporary delay in more remote deployments so they're occupied in areas where they can get up to maintenance. And then once they're on maintenance, the question is, can they then deploy and still get their shots at the wider interval? But the logistics are extremely difficult, and so it's a case-by-case decision, obviously not wanting to put a service member at risk for dying from insect allergy in a deployed situation, but also, you know, recognizing that in some cases, You know, if someone has had repeatedly only hives, there may be a trending to not have more severe reactions, and they may be doing something in a deployed situation that still enables them to get good access to care should they have a reaction. So it's not a simple answer. Each patient, you know, there's distinct issues that give you a benefit risk analysis, and that's a lot of what military allergy is involved in, trying to customize, adapt, and work for win-win situations for the person who's been affected. I'd like to thank my guest from Walter Reed Army Medical Center, Dr. Renata Engler. Dr. Engler, thank you for being our guest this week on Hot Topics in Allergy. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to Hot Topics in Allergy on ReachMD XM160. This show has been presented by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. For more information on the ACAAI, please visit ACAAI.org. For more information about this or any other show, please visit ReachMD.com, which now features on-demand podcasts. Thank you for listening.